Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 98, Space Shuttle Flight 28, STS-29. A Constellation Complete. Last time, we talked about the third flight of Atlantis, carrying out the classified STS-27 mission. We speculated about its secret payload, and dug deep into what dug deep into the thermal protection system of OV-104. The flight would later be regarded as an unheeded warning, but for now it was just the latest successful shuttle mission. Today, we'll be talking about STS-29. Now, you might be wondering what happened to STS-28. The truth is, there isn't really an interesting explanation. The payload for the flight wasn't ready, so the launch manifest was shuffled a bit. So for the first time, we have finally hit the scenario that was at least part of the reason for the ridiculous mission numbering system we had to endure for 16 flights. The mission number and the flight number don't line up. Are you all losing your minds with confusion? No, I didn't think so. Turns out it's fine, we'll just get over it. Anyway, this is the 8th flight of Discovery and the 28th flight of the shuttle, STS-29. Actually, we almost knew this flight as STS-61H, or at least most of the crew did. This is sort of similar to how STS-27 was mostly the crew of STS-62A. STS-61H was supposed to have launched sometime in the summer of 1986 and punched out a couple of commercial satellites. It would have had two payload specialists who are not on this flight, and it also would have had STS-51A mission specialist Anna Fisher, who was swapped out for Jim Bajan but it's pretty close to the same crew. Since I'm already discussing the crew, let's just get into it and meet who will be flying on this mission. Commanding the flight was Mike Coates, who we know from STS-41D, where he was the mission's pilot. This is his second of three flights, more on that later. Joining Coates up front as pilot was John Blaha. John Blaha was born on August 26, 1942 in San Antonio, Texas. He graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy and earned a master's in astronautical engineering from Purdue before heading off to the Air Force. He flew 361 combat missions in the skies of Vietnam, flying the F-4, F-102, F-106, and A-37. When he got home, he went to research pilot school at Edwards and then became an F-104 instructor pilot at test pilot school, before heading over to the U.K. for three years of work as a test pilot with the Royal Air Force. After all that, he returned home to work in the Pentagon, which is where NASA found him in 1980. I've met John Blaha in person a couple of times, and he's a pretty interesting dude. If you ever have a chance to visit the Kennedy Space Center, they do a pretty great dine with an astronaut experience, and Blaha has been known to turn up there, so keep an eye out. This is his first of five flights. Sitting in the back right of the flight deck, we find Mission Specialist 1, Bob Springer. Robert Springer was born on May 21, 1942 in St. Louis, Missouri, but he'd tell you that he's from Ashland, Ohio. He graduated both the U.S. Naval Academy and the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, earning a bachelor's and master's in naval science and then operations research and systems analysis. In between those two stints in school, he became a Marine and flew 550 combat missions over Vietnam, 300 in an F-4 fighter jet, and 250 in a Huey helicopter. Upon returning home, he got his master's, graduated from the Navy's test pilot school, tested 20 different types of planes and helicopters, and did some impressive-sounding work with NATO. NASA came calling in 1980, and this is his first of two flights. Riding right behind the pilot crew was Mission Specialist 2, Jim Buckley. We know Buckley as MS-2 on the secretive flight of Discovery on STS-51C and MS-2 on the packed to the gills STS-61A, which was a space lab mission that flew with a record-setting eight people. This is his third of four flights. And last but not least, riding down in the mid-deck, for the ride uphill at least, was Mission Specialist 3, Jim Bajan. James Bajan was born on February 22, 1952 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Bajan is our latest physician astronaut, having earned a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Drexel and a doctorate in medicine from Thomas Jefferson University. Bajan worked at 3M and then the U.S. Naval Test Center before doing a year in a general surgery residency and then going to work as a flight surgeon at the Johnson Space Center. He was selected as an astronaut in 1980. To give you an idea of what kind of guy Bajan is, in his downtime he works on mountain rescue techniques. Sounds relaxing. This is his first of two flights. 
After the Challenger accident, commercial satellites got the boot from the shuttle, which is probably something that deserves a supplemental at some point, but not today. Commercial satellites got the boot from the shuttle, so the original STS-61H cargo of a couple of commsats was gone. Instead, STS-29 would be deploying TDRS-D, the latest satellite in NASA's tracking and data relay satellite system, TDRS. Once it was successfully checked out, TDRS D would turn alchemy like into TDRS 4. TDRS 1 and TDRS 3 already provided coverage to most of low Earth orbit, but the plan was to have TDRS 4 take over TDRS 1's slot, with TDRS 1 becoming an on orbit spare. You might be wondering why poor old TDRS 1 was being relegated to backup status after only six years on orbit. Well, as you'll recall, TDRS 1 had a bit of a rough ride to the geostationary ring. Its upper stage failed, leaving the spacecraft well short of its target orbit. Thanks to a Herculean effort by engineers at the Goddard Space Flight Center, it limped into a proper orbit but used a lot of fuel doing so, which left less fuel for long-term station keeping. Over time, a spacecraft's orbit will be tugged at by a variety of different sources, requiring regular orbit maintenance. One of the most expensive of these perturbations to fix is inclination. So, Tedris 1's inclination was allowed to drift a little bit, and it had started to build up. This meant that every day it bobbed up and down, or north and south, in a figure 8 pattern called an analemma centered on the equator, which made it a little more tricky to use since it didn't just stay in one place. Tedris 4 would start out at the desired inclination and would be a lot more stable in the sky. Plus, the design life of these spacecraft was only like 7 years anyway, so they were trying to get ahead of any anticipated failures. Tedris 4 would be positioned at longitude 41 degrees west, which is sort of off the coast of Brazil, and then Tedris 1 would slide a few degrees west to chill out over the Brazil mainland. And Tedris 3 was still over at 171 degrees west, which is south of Hawaii. I know that was all a lot of numbers and a lot of saying the word Tedris over and over, but I guarantee that at least one of you out there appreciated knowing where all the Tedris spacecraft were located. Fun little side story, I recently had an opportunity to speak with some folks involved in the early days of Tedris, and was asking them all sorts of esoteric questions like this. At one point I said, I bet at the time, none of you expected that in 30 years, someone would be asking what longitude Tedris 3 was positioned at, but, well, here I am. If you're having a little bit of deja vu here, there's a reason. Space Shuttle Discovery deploying a Tedris spacecraft? Didn't we just hear about this mission? Actually, yeah, this flight is really similar to STS-26, just two flights ago. I thought that was kind of neat, because to me at least, it sort of showed that things were starting to get back to normal. There were Tedra satellites to get up there, so it was time to get to work. But since we won't need as much time to talk about the payload, let's take a moment to see where Discovery's been for the last couple of months. When we last saw OV-103, it had just landed at Edwards Air Force Base on October 3rd, 1988, closing out STS-26. After technicians safed the vehicle and got everything shut down, Discovery was hoisted on top of the shuttle carrier aircraft. On October 8th, five days after landing, it was shuttled, get it, back to the Kennedy Space Center. The day after that, it was rolled into one of the orbiter processor facility buildings. All three engines were removed for inspection and replacement of a few parts. As part of that, a small leak was found, so the engine was sent back to the manufacturer and a new engine was used. All three engines were back in before the end of 1988. Both Ohm's pods were also removed, again for routine maintenance. The flash evaporator was removed and replaced after the mild trouble it gave the STS-26 crew, and it was found to be clogged with foreign material, which explains the problem. In December, the OASIS instrument was installed in the payload bay. Remember, that's that thing that basically measured how stressed out the satellite gets during ascent. A few days after that, the crew came out to test things for themselves and make sure everything was as they expected. On January 19, 1989, Discovery was rolled over from the Orbiter Processor Facility to the Vehicle Assembly Building. Or was it January 23rd? I'm not sure. Literally in the same press kit on the same page, just a few paragraphs apart, both dates are listed. So I say we split the difference and call it January 21st. While all of this work was going on, the SRBs were being stacked in the VAB, and Tedris D was being checked out in the Vertical Processing Facility. So many facilities and so many acronyms. <laughs> 
Once the SRBs and external tank were in place on the mobile launch platform, Discovery was picked up on a giant crane and gently lowered into place alongside the external tank. The full shuttle stack departed the VAB on February 3rd, arriving at Launch Complex 39B a few hours later. Three days after that, Tedris D was loaded into Discovery's payload bay out at the pad. And lastly, a full dress rehearsal of the launch, the countdown demonstration test, was performed on February 7th. With everything ready to go, the launch was scheduled for March 11th, 1989, 160 days after landing in California. Well, the launch was actually delayed a couple more days due to some components that needed to be replaced, but on March 13th, 1989, Discovery and the STS-29 crew were ready to go. This was actually cutting it pretty close. For reasons that we'll discuss next time, the next mission in line had a strict launch window, and it needed that pad. So STS-29 would depart the pad one way or another by mid-March, either by going up or by rolling back. For their traditional pre-flight breakfast, the crew dressed up in nice business suits as a joking response to people who thought that the STS-26 crew's Hawaiian shirts were a bit too casual. Once they had doffed their business suits and donned their pressure suits, the crew were driven out to the pad on a foggy morning, settled into their seats, and waited for the fog to burn away. The launch was delayed while the fog lingered, and by the time it finally did dissipate, upper-level winds were too strong. But... Finally, after an extra hour and 50 minutes of sitting around, Discovery was go for launch, and at 9.57 a.m. Eastern Time, it did just that. Ascent was uneventful, and soon after main engine cutoff and external tank separation, crew members were floating out of their seats in order to snap some photos of the discarded tank. And thanks to a recommendation from the STS-27 Thermal Protection System Investigation, pilot John Blaha called down with an Ascent debris report. Thankfully, the report was nice and boring, with nothing noteworthy being observed. The highlight for Flight Day 1 was deploying the primary payload of the mission, Tedris D. Only a few hours into the flight, crew members were working closely with the ground as the Tedris spacecraft was put through a series of tests and checks to make sure that it had made it through the bumpy ride uphill intact. Thanks to Tedris 1 and Tedris 3, the crew were able to stay in contact with mission control for around 85% of each orbit which is quite an improvement from the 15% of the old ground-based systems. Step by step, the crew and mission controllers moved through the process. First, the support cradle holding Tedris D tilted up to the proper angle for deployment. Then, Discovery itself slewed to the deployment attitude. There was one scary moment when a whole bunch of computer errors flooded in from the payload, but it was just a temporary hiccup. Six hours and 13 minutes after lifting off, the restraints were released, Springs pushed on the base of the inertial upper stage holding Tedris D, and NASA's latest communication satellite was on its way. With that, the primary mission of STS-29 was complete, and the crew could exhale a bit and start to focus on secondary tasks. One secondary payload that ended up requiring quite a bit more crew involvement than expected was SHARE, and you just know that's an acronym. The Space Station Heat Pipe Advanced Radiator Element, or SHARE, was a test of a passive cooling technology being considered for use in an upcoming space station. SHARE was a 51-foot-long pipe running down the starboard side of Discovery's payload bay. On one end of it were a bunch of heaters, which would simulate actual heat-generating space station equipment. The pipe itself was actually two ammonia-filled pipes in a clever arrangement combined with a wire mesh and small grooves. The idea here was that ammonia near the heater would absorb the heat, vaporize, and travel down the long pipe. Once down there, it would release that heat and condense. The now liquefied ammonia would then travel through the mesh, which worked like a wick, and travel back down a second pipe to start over. Flanking the pipe were foot-long aluminum fin radiators, which would help dump the excess heat into space. Well, that's how it was supposed to work. Instead, bubbles of ammonia vapor were forming in the pipes, preventing the liquid ammonia from moving effectively, which prevented the heat from being removed effectively, which made the experiment, you know, overheat. So, instead of just setting the heaters to various levels and keeping an eye on things, the crew now had to intervene. But what to do? Imagine a pot of water being heated on a stove. As the water begins to boil, bubbles will form, 
but since your kitchen is presumably not in a microgravity environment, the bubbles rise to the top of the pot. In weightlessness, that doesn't happen. The bubbles just sort of sit there and get in the way. To see this in action, just search any video site for zero gravity bubbles or something along those lines. Astronauts love to put bubbles into blobs of water and show how they don't go anywhere. The bubbles in the share pipes aren't going to rise to the top because we're in space and there is no top. But what if we could fake it? All weight really is, is an acceleration. Gravity is accelerating us down. And you know what else makes acceleration? Rocket thrusters. So, over the next few days, the crew tried a variety of different heater settings, as well as blipping the RCS thrusters this way and that, hoping to settle the fluid. Eventually, in an effort to salvage the troubled share experiment, Discovery was turned into a giant centrifuge, being put into an end-over-end -end spin in an attempt to separate the fluid and vapor. The spin was pretty fast, too, clocking in at around 2 degrees a second. That might not sound like a ton, but for a spacecraft, that's really moving. They would complete a full rotation every three minutes. The crew delighted in the unusual view of the Earth whizzing past the windows, and they even busted out the IMAX camera they had on board to capture the unusual visual. Unfortunately, a fun time for the crew and a cool IMAX shot was all that they got out of it. Cher refused to cooperate, and that was that. One other secondary payload I thought I'd call out was a student experiment proposed by John C. Vellinger. When the experiment was first selected, he was in high school, but by the time of the flight, he was a mechanical engineering major in his senior year at Purdue. The experiment consisted of a special incubator box containing 32 chicken eggs. Half of them were fertilized two days before the launch, and half were fertilized nine days before the launch. Actually, I bet with that two-day delay, that was supposed to be the day of the launch and a week before the launch, but whatever. The development of the chicken embryos would be studied and compared to a control group on the ground to see how they were affected by weightlessness. Oh, and among the experiment's sponsors was, of all things, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Hmm, does this sound familiar? It should. We actually talked about it back on episode 92, where I covered the mission STS-51L was supposed to be. More than three years later, John's student experiment was finally flying. These days, no episode of The Space Above Us is complete without some funny little story from the oral histories. And since I was a little concerned that this flight might be a boring carbon copy of STS-26, I came prepared and have two, both coming straight from the mouth of the flight's commander, Mike Coates. First, remember how I said that John Blaha was an interesting dude? He's also sort of a weird dude. As Coates tells it, Blaha is an incredibly hard worker. He works so hard that he sort of gets tunnel vision and blocks out what's going on around him, and even what's, like, socially acceptable. So he was known to absentmindedly ask his fellow crewmates to bring him dinner or something because he's so busy. Eventually, mission specialists Jim Buckley and Bob Springer had had enough of this and came to Coates, saying that Blaha had redefined the term MS. Instead of mission specialist, it was now manservant. The next day, they came to Coates again and said, we're going to kill Blaha. So Coates goes with the joke and asked what they'd do with the body. And they said they'd stuff it into the wet trash. But where will you put the wet trash if you've got Blaha in there? Well, they said they'd put him into the airlock instead. But what if there's an emergency EVA? Well, then they just let him float out. Coates laughs and says to just put up with it for a couple more days, and then he'll help them kill Blaha. <laughs> a few days later, Discovery lands, and once things calm down, Buckley and Springer walk up to Coates and say, okay, let's go. What do you mean? We're going to kill Blaha. Yeah, okay, I changed my mind. I can't kill Blaha. <laughs> so I guess the moral of the story is, work hard, but maybe not too hard. Okay, one more. I swear if I ever write a space book, I might just follow in the footsteps of David Hitt and Heather Smith and orient it around the oral histories. They're really good. Anyway, Mike Coates has a great story about how it was that he was able to fly three times. His wife, Diane, wasn't wild about the dangers involved in spaceflight, especially after the Challenger accident. Coates himself was given the task of talking to the crew's families after the accident, so he was all too familiar with the risks. So the couple made a deal. Mike would fly twice. Since this was his second flight and their last chance to do something like this, 
Diane Coates had the idea that she wanted to be invited to the White House. Considering that this was the first shuttle flight of the George H.W. Bush presidency, and that he was a fan of the space program, it might actually be doable. Diane suggested that Mike fly something on the mission for the president. Except Bush had just spent eight years as vice president, and vice presidents tend to be more involved in the space program, so he had plenty of flown artifacts. So instead, Diane suggested that they fly something for the first lady, Barbara Bush. So they find room in the crew's personal effects and fly a small gold shuttle charm. Diane reminds Mike to mention it to President Bush when he calls during the mission. Mike responds that he's not scheduled to call, but Diane insists that he'll call. Sure enough, on flight day four, they get a call from President Bush. Coates dutifully mentions the gift that they'd flown for the First Lady, and a delighted President Bush immediately invites the crew to the White House. So, that's a victory for Diane Coates, but it doesn't explain how Mike Coates got to fly for a third time. Well, for their visit to the White House, Diane brought a shuttle-shaped dog treat for the Bush's dog and left it for the Bushes to find. Apparently, they were pretty impressed when they found it, since a couple of weeks later, Mike arrived at work and found a message to call the White House. He and his wife were invited to a state dinner. At one point, Coates found himself sitting on one side of Audrey Hepburn, with President Bush on her other side, and Bush leaning in front of Hepburn to ask him space questions. He eventually asks when Coates will fly again, and Coates explains the agreement with his wife. Bush asks if he'd like to fly again, and Coates says, well, sure. Bush immediately gets up, finds Diane, and strikes a deal. If she'll let Mike fly one last time, they'll be invited back to the White House. So there you go. It's sort of unusual for me to dig this deep into stories like this, but it's sort of fun. So if you have thoughts on it, let me know. Are you a fan, or do you wish I'd just stick to the technical stuff? My inclination is to maybe nudge the oral history dial up a little bit, but not let things get unbalanced. As always, you can reach me via email at jp at thespaceabove.us, and there's other contact info available at thespaceabove.us. But enough of all that, we've still got to get STS-29 home. When the time came to return to Earth, despite traveling at around 17,500 miles per hour, the Ohm's engines only had to slow Discovery down by about 213 miles per hour. That's pretty wild when you consider that it landed at about 235 miles per hour. In between those two events, there was a nominal entry that would be completely unremarkable, except for the fact that for the first time in NASA human spaceflight history, there was no blackout period. Thanks to the new additions in the Tedris fleet, STS-27 had a much shorter blackout period, and STS-29 managed to maintain contact all the way down to the runway. After 4 days, 23 hours, 38 minutes, and 50 seconds aloft, Discovery was safely back on terra firma, ready to start the process all over again. And no John Blahas were injured in the making of this mission. Next time, it's Atlantis' turn on the launch pad again. It's got a payload with a strict timetable and an eye on a place that's occasionally even hotter than Florida. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Bye.